All right, welcome to Equipping Hour. Good to see you this morning. I'm going to open us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to be your children, to belong to you, to have all of your riches in Christ as our inheritance, to have eternal life, which is to know you, to have every need, every true need already met. And Lord, you know our hearts, you know the restlessness in us, you know how quick we are to label our desires and preferences as needs, to feel the disappointment between our expectations and reality. Help us this morning as we study contentment to think again on who we are and what we deserve and what we get instead in your big, infinite grace Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to have your word with its surgical precision do work in us. And we pray for help uh, by the Holy Spirit who penned these words, these truths, that you, O oh Lord, might do work in us to make us pleasing to you, particularly in the areas of gratitude and contentment, joy in your good and sovereign purposes and a resulting witness in this world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. For our equipping hour this morning, we are continuing our look at contentment. And I want to remind us this key text from Philippians chapter 4. And Paul says these really surprising words from jail. He says, not that I speak from want... Philippians 4.11, for I learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. And as we looked last week, we, we see that rather than bringing my circumstances up to my expectations, Paul leveled his expectations out at the circumstances that God's good hand of providence delivered. And he says, verse 12, I know how to get along with humble means. Uh, that, that would take a learning curve for us. And he says, and I also know how to live in abundance. That's a different kind of learning curve. We tend to think that if we have abundance, we're content. Uh, not so. Paul knew that there was a learning to be done when you have what you think you need. To regarner an appreciation of grace and a radical dependence upon the Lord. He says, in any and all things, I have learned the secret of being filled and the secret of going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I mentioned last week a couple of recommended resources for you, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment by Jeremiah Burroughs and The Greener Grass Conspiracy by Stephen Altrog. Uh, Greg Bender is uh, overseeing the bookstore back there, and he is uh, making sure we have copies of those, so you can stop by the book table, pick those up. We also have these resources in the church and seminary library that you can check out, or you can come down to the campus and read if you so desire. I want to give you again the definition of contentment from Jeremiah Burroughs. He says, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise, fatherly disposal in every condition. And last week we sort of flipped that definition to describe sinful discontentment as a bitter, inward, grumbling, natural frame of spirit which resists and resents God's wise, fatherly disposal in a given circumstance. It is essentially not embracing with gratitude the goodness of God in his ordering of my situation. And so uh, we looked at a number of sins that discontentment breeds. And then I want to remind us of some caveats about godly contentment. Godly contentment is not opposed to prayer. You can ask God for your situation to change. Godly contentment is not opposed to sorrow. It is appropriate at times to grieve and sorrow and lament, and you can still be content in those things. Uh, 
And godly contentment is not opposed to legitimate means of improvement of your circumstance. It is okay to get another job. Uh, You just can't assume that a new job will solve discontentment in the heart. Jobs can't do that. They lack the power. And we talked also about a kind of holy discontentment, the kind of discontentment with my own spiritual growth. Where am I at with Christ? It is appropriate for us not to be content with our state of sanctification. If you coast, you're toast. Uh, You don't take your foot off the gas when it comes to growth in Christ. We ought to have a holy discontentment about that. Uh, That is a, a contrast to spiritual laziness and lethargy. And there's also a holy discontentment at the world around us. It is a broken, God-cursed, sin-affected world that is not as it should be. All creation, personified in Romans 8, groans sinlessly in a God-honoring manner at the state of things in this world. And it's appropriate for Christians to groan likewise. There is a holy discontentment in recognizing that things should be different in the world and in our own hearts. So we talked about some fighting theology, some imperatives that you and I need to fight for grace contentment. And we'll pick up this morning at number eight of 18. So if you need the first seven, you can go back and listen to last week. Number eight, the eighth imperative that we need to fight for contentment is simply this. Don't confuse pleasant circumstances with blessing. It is very popular in our day for people to talk about being blessed. Hashtag blessed is a thing. And people by that often mean, I like the way things are going in my life. Does the hashtag blessed happen at the social media post of a trial that brings grief and sorrow and further brokenness in one's world? That's not normally the word people use. But the blessing of God is not equal to pleasant circumstances. And we have to get out of the confusion of thinking those are the same thing. In fact, I want you to turn to Psalm 81. And there are many angles to rethinking affliction and hardship and trial Paul's imprisonment, or the loss of a loved one, or a a terminal diagnosis, Uh, thinking about these hard things as the blessings of God for various reasons. But the angle I want to take this morning comes from Psalm 81, and it is at the misinterpretation of so-called blessings. There are pleasant circumstances in my life, and so God must be happy with me, and he's showering blessings upon me. Listen, there is no doubt that God sends his rain and his sunshine on the just and the unjust. All of the world benefits from what we call the, the common grace of the Lord. He, he loves his enemies, and he provides for them, and they walk around in thankless oblivion, at the giver of all good things. But Psalm 81 points out something really interesting. Look at verse 11. My people, God says, did not listen to my voice and Israel was not willing to obey me. So I released them over to the stubbornness of their heart that they would walk in their own devices Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would quickly subdue their enemies, and I would turn my hand against their adversaries. Those who hate Yahweh would cower before him, and their time of punishment would be forever. And I would feed you with the finest of the wheat, and with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. What is God doing here? He is giving his people over to their own desires, their, their own heart trajectories, Uh, There's a theological category, we label this as judicial hardening. That is, in the justice of God, he hardens you according to the direction you want to go. He solidifies the calcified state of your own wayward heart. Another way to say that is, God may give you what you want. And that would not be a blessing. Uh, That would be a tragic judgment from God. 
So beware when things are going your way and your heart is actually adrift. Beware. God may be reinforcing the drift as a judgment. You may get what you want. You may experience financial blessings in your business. You may experience peace in your family. You may experience a a, a long strain of good health. Things may be going your way. But if your heart is not on the way of fidelity to the Lord, you may actually be in a hardened condition against him. So all of that to say, pleasant circumstances aren't always what they seem. In the case of Psalm 81.11, one category for pleasant circumstances is actually the judgment of God. God lets you get what you want. And this is a pattern you see throughout the scriptures. Um, men in Romans 1 wanted deviancy of mind and of moral behavior, and God gave them over to their lusts. In other words, a, a judgment of God that increases their recalcitrance and their rebellion against God. I, I don't want God, I want this stuff over here, and God may give you what you want. That's not a blessing. Number nine, a ninth imperative for us to fight for contentment is the command to cultivate gratitude. Cultivate gratitude. I want you to turn to Psalm 103. And I say cultivate gratitude because while at some points gratitude comes easy, oftentimes it takes work. In our home, we at mealtime regularly, in a disciplined fashion, in rote fashion, express gratitude. And, and when our kids were younger, I would say, okay, who wants to thank mom for dinner? You always have to thank the cook. And people would sit around in silence. And we couldn't eat until the cook was thanked by every participant in the meal. And I think my kids got tired of me asking, and now they just, they beat me to it. Thanks, mom, for dinner. Well, that's great. But it took work to cultivate that expression of gratitude. Whether or not we're grateful in the heart always is another matter, but at least we're expressing gratitude for what has been prepared. And then the second half of that, who wants to thank mom for dinner? Okay, great. Who wants to thank God for dinner? And it is this expression of gratitude that is appropriate every time we eat a meal. And it's an expression of gratitude that we ought to have in our hearts every time we take a breath. Every time our heart beats, every time we take a step, for everything that God and his good governance puts into our lives, whether we might deem it a a hardship or or a blessing, we ought to express gratitude. These are common commands throughout scripture. Give thanks in all things. Give thanks at all times. In everything, give thanks. These are repeated throughout scripture because God knows we need the commands. Say it with your mouth, mean it with your heart. And just a caution about uh, sort of the, the mealtime prayers or the, there are certain times where we just pray because we have to, we're supposed to, we've, we've put a pattern in place. I want you to know those patterns are good, those disciplines are good. They can easily become meaningless. My encouragement to you is just mean them. And allow those rote experiences, those disciplined, cultivated experiences of gratitude, forge gratitude in the heart for all things at all times. Here's Psalm 103, verses 10 to 14. God has not dealt with us according to our sins. He has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. Just stop right there. This takes us back to the first two imperatives we looked at. Get a right view of yourself and your sins and get a great big infinite view of God's mercy and his grace. Who am I? What do I deserve? What do I get instead? And these two realities ought to be the end of discontentment for us always. Whatever else I get or don't get in this life, God knows me and calls me his own and he has forgiven my sins. He has not treated me according to what I deserve. (sighs) anything else is gravy. That's the psalmist's perspective here. 
He goes on in verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness, that Old Testament word for grace, toward those who fear him. As far as east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so Yahweh has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our form, he remembers that we are but dust. God hasn't forgotten who we are, but God chooses to forget what we deserve in his grace, in his loving kindness that has no end. He's made us his own. That thought ought to snuff out every ounce of discontentment in us. It ought to promote a profound gratitude that we never escape from. And God knows we're dirt. God brought man out of the dirt. Adam, uh, Adama is the word for dirt or earth. God brought Adam out of the dirt. And he said, when you die, you're going back to the dirt. Uh, we are merely flesh. We are human. That's not an excuse for our sin. It is a recognition of our weakness. And God just reminds us that he loves and loves and loves. And the love he gives to us is not due us. He doesn't owe us. He will not be debtor to anyone. We have not earned his favor, his loving kindness. We did not deserve it. He just gives and gives and gives. That is a provocation for us for unstoppable gratitude. We have to cultivate it. We recognize our weakness in this. Number 10, to help us cultivate contentment, we need to accept the normalcy of affliction. Come to grips with the reality that affliction is normal in this life. And, and we could look at this from a lot of different angles. The, the mere fact that death has entered the world through one man's sin and now we all sin out of our spiritual death, and it affects everything. Even the creation around us is affected by humanity's rebellion against God. But 1 Peter chapter 4 points us to our particular affliction. Every human suffers, but a, but a Christian suffers in a unique way. A Christian suffers under the affliction we would call persecution. And this is normal. 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved. Don't you love that address? From God, through Peter, in your Bible, to you. Just a reminder, you're loved. And what he's about to say makes this address particularly pointed. You're suffering. And I love you. This isn't some sort of plan B or surprise to God. And so God says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial among you. It comes upon you for your testing. Don't be surprised as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you're sharing the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. This is a real help for our contentment. Our discontentment cries out, God's not good, or he doesn't know what he's doing because I'm suffering. And the Bible tells us suffering's normal here. For this short while, and First Peter fast forwards the tape for us. The suffering is accomplishing something. You're sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Uh, that has nothing to do with the atonement, by the way. Uh, that means you become a partaker with him, sharing in his identity, walking in his footsteps, enduring the kinds of things he endured, not for the sake of saving souls, only he could do that, but in a very real sense for presenting to a watching world what a suffering servant in Messiah came and did. Your life is a billboard for the sufferings of Christ because you're with him. You're a, a learner, a disciple, a follower, and, and he suffered, and I'm going to follow him, and I'm going to suffer. And guess what's coming? Exaltation in glory. 
And it's worth it. Listen, that's why the world can't touch biblical contentment. A Christian has access to realities that the world cannot know. So the command here is to rejoice. That's a fundamentally different perspective. Number 11 on our list is to trust God's purpose in affliction. Trust God's purpose in affliction. I want you to turn to a familiar text. We, we memorized one last week. Do you remember it? Psalm 119.65, God is good and he does good. Yes, you said it with me. Thank you. If you don't know Romans 8.28, we're going to memorize that one this morning together as a group. Okay, hopefully your heart knows it already. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And there are a number of different English renderings of that. You probably muttered some other words than I just said. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Both of those are good translations. God is not properly the subject in the original text, but it is a divine passive. It's not as if all things just choose for themselves to work for our good. They don't have the power to do that. God causes them is, is the appropriate understanding of this text. And what do we put under the banner of all things? All things. There's not a single thing that a Christian can encounter that does not surrender to God's purposes for the Christian. And what is the good according to Romans 8.28? We find it in the next verse. That we might be conformed to the image of Christ. Your Christ-likeness under the rubric of the glory of God, is his purpose for everything that comes into your life. It is his purpose when you have plenty. It is his purpose when you are in want. When you're full and satisfied and happy, God's been kind to you. And when things are removed that would otherwise make your life comfortable, God is good and he does good and he's working good for you by every molecule in the universe, none of which are rogue. This is the application of sovereignty to circumstance personalized for you. And this terminates in purpose. God's purpose for you is his glory and your good. What is your good according to Romans 8, 28 to 30? Your resembling Christ. And the outcome of that is guaranteed. In the eternal state, you will look like the second person of the Trinity in character, in holiness, as far as it is possible for a finite being to resemble the infinite second person of the Trinity. We will be like him, we will see him as he is. This is your destiny. This is what you were predestined for, called for, justified for, glorified unto according to Romans 8. Now we need some help to think through what this means for us. In Arizona, we have some of these uh, neighborhoods with irrigation. Maybe you live in an irrigation neighborhood. There are these irrigation canals, and on a schedule, the water flows through the canals, and you have these little gates, and you lift them open so that your yard or your field can be flooded by the irrigation canals according to the schedule. And you can shut those gates to keep your yard dry. You open the gates to let the water in. There are times where I might desire that my field be flooded with cool, refreshing water, and God shuts the gate. Why is God shutting the gate? Well, first and foremost, he's good and he does good. Let's just start there. God shutting the gate is good because he's good and he only knows how to do what is good. And I don't know what God's up to. 
I don't have a window into God's specific purposes for specific circumstances in my life. It would be arrogant for me to claim some sort of omniscience, some sort of window into the divine plan. I must trust him when I cannot trace him, as Spurgeon said. And so we must trust God's purpose in affliction. God may in his kindness shut off a field in order to divert the flow of your life to where it needs to go. Where does God think the water needs to go? What field does it need to inundate? We don't know what he's up to. God knows precisely what to do. And so part of trusting God's purpose in affliction to bring about contentment in our life is the acknowledgement that God is good and he knows what he's doing. And he has given us a window into what he is doing ultimately. We, we have the big picture, which is really helpful. Your good and his glory. Your Christ-likeness. All for his honor. We may not know the details in the immediate, but we trust him. Number 12 this morning. If you're going to fight for contentment, you have to recalibrate your goals. Recalibrate your goals to God's goals. This is a reflection on what we just looked at in Romans 8. If my goal is X, then my needs are Y. Right? If my goal is a medium rare ribeye steak for dinner, then what do I need to meet that goal? Well, I'm, I'm going to have to go get a ribeye somewhere. I'm going to have to have uh, propane or charcoal for the grill. I'm going to need the implements. We, we begin to talk about needs as they relate to goals. And, and again, as I said last week, we, we don't want to take the word need out of our vocabulary and sort of uh, every time somebody says, oh, I, I, I need to go pick up a steak. You don't need anything. You got your sins forgiven and heaven is your home. Quit talking about your needs that way. Uh, we don't need to go overboard with language so that we can't communicate anymore. And we can talk about non-ultimate things sort of intermediate goals, I want a steak for dinner, that's a desire. In order to meet that desire, I need these implements, these materials, these raw ingredients. That's okay, we, we can talk about things that way. We're, we're not violating God's ideas of needs when we speak about non-ultimate things. But in the Christian life, if, if my goal is comfort, and ease, and health, the kind of health I had in my physical prime, then what are my needs? All the latest vitamins, every surgical procedure, everything that can be done, I need for the technology to improve so that they can make artificial joints better than my originals. And, and there I've just set my preferences, I've set my desires at a place that demands certain things. And this is where we need recalibration. What is God's goal for my life? My Christ-likeness. If I reframe it that way, what does my Christ-likeness, what does my increase in sanctification need most? If I ask that question, and, and maybe, and it's kind of a scary prayer, God Whatever it takes for me to be more like Christ, would you do that? What's coming? Because in all likelihood, it is, it is not going to require perfect health, financial ease, everything going my way, easy relationships, snap my fingers and things get done, success after success after success. Though that's often what we pray for and what we long for, if you take James 3 for a second, you, you know the formula, um, consider it all joy whenever you encounter various trials. Why? Because trials produce something. And there's a sort of a chain of events in James 1 that terminates in telos, your completion, your maturity in Christ. And if you sort of reverse that, if you start with, I want to be mature in Christ, how do I get that? 
and work backwards through that section of James 1, you find out that my maturity in Christ comes with perseverance having its effect. How do I get perseverance? Whenever I encounter various trials. And if you work it backwards, you get back to the consider it all joy because, wow, God's answering my prayer. I want to be more like Christ. How do I get that? Let endurance have its perfect work. That's how I get to be like Christ. Great. Where do I get endurance? Various trials. Oh, Lord, thank you for this trial. You're answering my prayer. This is a rearranging of our goals. And, and if we set our goals after God's goals, then our, our needs become different. If we set our expectations after God's expectations, you will have suffering in this world. Then my needs aren't framed in terms of how do I avoid suffering at all cost? And my needs now become, God, I need your strength for whatever you have for me. I need to learn contentment in case you give me a bunch of stuff. And I need to learn contentment in case you take it all away. My needs change if my expectations are different. My needs change in conformity to my goals. If my goal is to be an Olympic sprinter, then I've got some real needs that are not according to the way I'm living my life right now. And so our needs actually conform to our goals and expectations. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. The creator of all things came to earth and he read our hearts. He saw right through us. He describes the world seeking after all these things. What do you eat? What do you drink? What do you wear? You say, well, that's pretty normal. I, I deal with those things every day. I, I have to give consideration to them. And Jesus describes it as a worldly exercise to seek after these things. And, and I think he has in mind the, the kind of seeking after these things as if they're ultimate, as if they are the primary need. What does Jesus say in Matthew 6, Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. And all these things will be added. There is a priority to what we must go after. And if you get that priority right, contentment follows. In Luke chapter 10, we have another word along the same lines. And you remember the scene in Luke 10, Mary and Martha are about two different things. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, enjoying his presence, hanging on his every word, wanting to be with him. And Martha's making meal preparations and working in the kitchen. And and no doubt the meal has to be prepared if if people are to eat. Somebody's got to do this. Jesus isn't here knocking meal preparation. But there is something going on in Martha's heart that Jesus addresses. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. Do you hear the the heart disposition coming out in Jesus' assessment of the situation? It would be one thing to say, Mary gets to sit at Jesus' feet, rejoice with those who rejoice. I'm going to prepare this meal. I must decrease. Everyone else must increase. To Jesus be all the glory as I prepare this pork chop. She wasn't making a pork chop yet. We haven't got to the book of Acts. There's a way to go about meal prep in a way that doesn't dishonor the Lord. But she is worried and bothered. And look what Jesus says. Only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good part. It shall not be taken away from her. 
Remember when Jesus said, I have food you know not of. My food is to do the will of my Father. There's something like that in Mary's heart here. Yeah, dinner sometime, but I'm going to sit with Jesus. Seeking first his kingdom, seeking first the Lord. These are priority dispositions of the heart that fuel contentment. Number 13. Value the testimony of a grace-contented heart. Value the testimony of a grace-contented heart. Turn to Daniel chapter 3. The world watches. The world sees our discontentment. So as we talked about last week, it is the, the normal language of the world around us to complain And so when believers do not complain, particularly under adverse circumstances, they stand out like a sore thumb or they stand out like stars against the black backdrop of the emptiness of space. Daniel 3.25, we come across these three young men, Ezariah, Mishael, and Hananiah. Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded, verse 24, he hurriedly stood up, he answered and said to his high officials, was it not the three men we cast uh, tied up into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, certainly. He answered and said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Here we have a pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the Trinity. This is Jesus, as it were, in the fiery furnace. And what do we notice? These three valued the glory of God rather than their own personal safety or their physical comfort, even the very normal human desire for self-preservation. They said, we're going to serve God. You can't make us bow down. We're not going to surrender to idolatries. We're not going to become pragmatic and save our skins And the world took notice. It's recorded for us in a remarkable way here. We see a similar reality in Acts 16. Turn there for a moment. We began this morning and last week in the book of Philippians. And Acts 16 takes us to the city of Philippi. It's an interesting start that brings out some of the themes we see in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Verse 16, it happened as we were going to the place of prayer, a servant girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to verse 25. Um, Short story there, they uh, were dragged out of the marketplace for preaching the gospel and sent to jail. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God in jail, and the prisoners were listening to them. Uh, This is not theatrical. This is not an act. This is not a show. This is just the overflow of contented hearts. Hey, we got to preach the gospel. We got to suffer for Christ's name, and people got to listen to us, and now we have a captive audience (laughs) to give more praise to God, to give testimony of the gospel. The prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the jailhouse were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened, everyone's chains were unfastened, and when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword, was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Uh, Why would a Roman soldier commit suicide with open doors? Because it was his life for the task If prisoners escaped, he would be killed. And so uh, just a matter of honor and duty, he would take his own life because he assumed the prisoners had escaped. Paul cried out with a loud voice, don't harm yourself, we're all here. He called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. After he brought them out, he he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
Here's the guy on the outside of the bars asking the people who were captives of the Roman Empire, behind bars, in chains, prisoners, you have something I don't have, how do I get it? Evidently, it was more than the prisoners who had been listening to Paul and Silas singing and giving testimony. The jailer himself, who was free, is asking, how do I get out of my bondage? The prisoners were the ones in need of some miraculous rescue, and the doors miraculously opened, and the jailer says, I'm the one that needed rescue. How do I get saved? They said, verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your house. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his household. And notice the result. He took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. So this is a higher caste to lower caste, humble service. There's a, an apparent transformation in a man's heart here. And the transformation is evident in that uh, he takes this message to his whole house. He brought them to his house, set food before them. He rejoiced greatly with his whole household because he believed in God. Really remarkable scene. What would you do? Call your lawyer. Complain. Listen, there, there's a, there are appropriate places to call for Roman justice. There were times when Paul did that. I'm a Roman citizen. Are you going to beat me in public? But here, Paul says, the Lord has me in jail for preaching the gospel. We're going to sing. Paul counted a privilege to suffer for Christ. And it was evangelism. And it was effective evangelism. And God used it to bring people to himself. This church has known suffering that was a platform for evangelism. Is your heart content in the Lord? Like an Azariah, Mishael, Hananiah. Like a Paul and Silas. Such that a content heart becomes a platform for evangelism and affliction. It's a remarkable scene. That takes us to Philippians 2. Turn there. You just think the... The people at the church at Philippi must have known the church's origins. Perhaps they rehearsed their own personal church history. And listen to these words. Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will be blameless and innocent Children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to boast, because I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And then Paul autobiographically says, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all you also rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Paul's commands here for joy in the midst of affliction come from Paul writing this from jail with the backdrop of the beginning of the church at Philippi in jail. And Philippians has rightly been called the letter of joy or the letter of rejoicing. You see those themes throughout the book. And it is a prison letter. How do these two things go together? from a heart that's content with God's good ordering of his purposes for his children. Number 14, you and I need to build a heart compass that points home. We need to build a heart compass that points home. Perhaps you have been lost in the wilderness Perhaps you have trekked on an unfamiliar trail. Maybe you've been on a long voyage. Maybe you've been out at sea where you can't see land anymore. Navigate by the stars. Maybe navigate by GPS. There's this sinking feeling we have at times that, oh, I, 
I'm not sure I know where I am. I'm not sure I know how to get home from here. Probably the most heart-stirring experience I've had like that was in a cave in East Tennessee. And it was a cave I had been in a number of times. It was a cave that had uh, something like a, a mile or two loop inside the darkness uh, well beyond the place where any light gets in, you know, the kind of darkness that when everybody turns out their lamps and you put your hand in front of your face, you wonder whether you still have a hand. <laughs> the darkness is just impenetrable and thick. And, and I'd been in there with a couple of friends. I'd been in there by myself. And, and one day, a group of people decided, hey, let's all go together to the cave and my friend John brought his dog. So we had, I think, 19 or 20 people and a dog. I don't know if you like caving or even the thought of listening to the rest of the story strikes terror in your heart. But part of the cave, and in fact, the way you get onto the loop in this cave is through one of those small holes. We called it the birth canal. And you've got to sort of narrow your shoulders and squeeze on your belly. And it, it is not a long passage. It's probably three or four feet long. But you can imagine getting 20 people and a dog through the birth canal. And then, and then out into the vast caverns and the trails. And, and they're well marked. And when you do the loop and you come back around, there's a, a tall, kind of sharp rock you have to look for. And down there below that in the corner is that hole that leads back out. And, and if you miss that hole, you're going to do the loop again. And, and we got about 10 yards past that rock and that exit door. And I paused. And somebody said out loud, Oh, are we lost? And you could feel the tension turn to panic. And people, I mean, we just lost the whole crowd. <laughs> I had to backtrack the 10 yards or so. No, we're, we're here. Here's where we need to go. But it was terrifying. And I had that thought, what, what if we did miss it? What if we're down here forever? And, and I've got all these people with me and that dog. <laughs> we eventually made it out. And then it's a it's another 20 minutes from that birth canal exit until you can start to see light again. And I will tell you that the effect of light on the soul in those moments is profound. Because it says, oh, okay, we still have hiking to do. We've still got to climb over these things and get around this obstacle and get the dog over that rock and whatever. But, but we can see glimmers of light and so we're home. We're not home yet. Nobody's taking a hot shower. Nobody's eating a hot meal. But the feeling of we're home sweeps over the soul and brings recovery. And what I mean by a, a heart compass that points home is to have that glimmering of light in your soul at all times. Whatever valley of deep darkness you're walking through here, your good shepherd, Psalm 23, is taking you home. And it might be in the next five minutes, it might be in the next five decades. But do you see the light? Does your heart point home. This is something to cultivate in us. The, we must have the pilgrim mindset. And again, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we, we get this perspective. What is a pilgrim? A, a pilgrim is someone who, who doesn't belong where he is and he's headed to where he belongs. 1 Peter 2.11 Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul, keeping your conduct excellent amongst the Gentiles. This here becomes a motivation for holy living, for different living, for an otherworldly kind of trek through this life. But it is predicated on a reality. You are a sojourner. That means you're a pilgrim, you're, you're on a trek, and you're in exile. Uh, you don't belong here. 
you and I have to have that mindset. If, if we're going to have contentment, our contentment can't rest in our circumstances here. Here is not home. Does your heart point home? I'll turn your attention to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. All these, and he lists Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abram, and Sarah, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. Having seen them and welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Listen, God will keep his promises. Every promise he made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob will be kept to the letter. And yet they died in faith, not receiving the culmination. They lived in exile. They were sojourners. They were pilgrims in this life. That is to be our attitude. And when you have the light, it may still be hard trekking, but you have home in view. Number 15, learn to enlist a right sense of duty. This is not the pilgrim mindset, but the soldier mindset. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 3 and 4. Here's the command from Paul to Timothy. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the days of uh, the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. You know, it would be a strange thing for a soldier in an army to complain about the lump in his bedroll. Ah, the food's cold. Where are we going? Are we there yet? Soldiers don't do that kind of thing. I've been reading a biography of Stonewall Jackson. He he had such a sense of duty that... As a, as a young officer, he was told by a commanding officer, wait outside my office. He went there and he sat bolt upright in the chair waiting outside the office for the, for the general. And the general forgot about him and left. And the next morning came back and found Stonewall Jackson still sitting bolt upright in that chair waiting for the next order. And this from a profound sense of duty. Do you have a soldier's mindset? No soldier in active service, and Christian, you are a soldier in active service, implicates himself in civilian affairs. Uh, What does Paul mean by that to Timothy? Um, Don't be so absorbed in the things that this world goes after that it distracts you from your duty. Listen, in some circles, duty has been made a bad word. Duty is not a bad word. You and I are obligated by our duty to Christ to follow him, to obey him, to go where he leads and to do what he says. And in our discontentments where our expectations are for personal comfort, maybe safety, health, prosperity, whatever it is, we've lost sight of our sense of duty. I've been purchased with a price and I'm not my own. I am blood bought and I am his. Yes, sir. Where are we going today, sir? And there's no better one to follow. To be a soldier, wanting mimosas for breakfast, afternoon naps, me time, Egyptian cotton sheets, it's just out of place. (laughs) Number 16, worship God. If we're going to be content, we must worship God. Here's what Jeremiah Burroughs says. Suppose God said, I will use you in a suffering condition, and I will have you to honor me in this way. What if God just wants to use you in a suffering condition for his glory, for his purposes? What ought our mindset to be? God, I will worship you. You must increase, I must decrease. Use me as you see fit. Soli Deo Gloria, from you, through you, and to you are all things. To you be the glory forever. Amen. Worship God. What is the picture of worship in Romans 12, 1? In view of the mercies of God, 
Bring the whole walking carcass of your life up onto the altar of sacrifice and service to Christ. Be a living sacrifice. What would it mean for us to be content in whatever God brings? To to read the word, to pray, to listen to the word taught, to sing with the saints. All of that is worship, yes. Public expressions of worship that, that everyone can see. But I would suggest that a greater revealer of a worshiping heart is the internal response to difficult circumstance. Burroughs goes on to say, we worship God by doing what pleases God. And we do as well worship God by being pleased with what God does. You see, the grumbling heart just took the sacrifice off the altar. The grumbling heart just stopped worshiping God and began bowing to the altar of self-love. So to have contentment, we must worship God. I'm going to go back to Psalm 119. And that verse you memorized last week, verse 65, begins a stanza that is so helpful for us in understanding our relationship to God in affliction. Listen to the first words. You have dwelt, said that wrong, you have dealt well with your slave, O Yahweh, according to your word. Is that your heartbeat? God, you are good and you do good. In affliction, you have dealt well. I'm your slave. And he says, teach me good discernment and knowledge. I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. The arrogant have smeared me with lying. With all my heart, I will observe your precepts. Their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. This is the worship of God in affliction, recognizing God's good purposes in affliction. Enemies may be having their good days while I'm afflicted, but it is good and you've dealt well with me. It's a worshipful heart. Number 17, look to the example of Christ. You remember the words of Isaiah 53, he did not open his mouth. He went like a sheep to the slaughter before his accusers. When we think about what it means to be content, we look to Jesus He did not in those moments seek to preserve his reputation or the esteem of others. He did not avoid the physical pain of the cross. He did not worship the normal creature comforts. In fact, he said the son of man has no place to lay his head. And he was perfectly innocent. And perfectly content to absorb the injustices. Mark 14, 36, you remember the prayer in the garden. If there's any other way but your will be done. Jesus' contentment was bound up in his service to the Father to rescue a people for his own glory. And number 18, lastly in our list here, we must depend upon the strength of Christ. I'll turn your attention back to where we started in Philippians 4. And this verse that Almost every high school football player has memorized. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We can beat those other guys. And they're saying the same thing. The posters are in both locker rooms. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me does not guarantee the victory in a football game. It does not guarantee uh, getting out of jail for Paul. Paul wrote this from jail. He he did not mean, I can get out of jail through Christ who strengthens me. And he had good precedent. The door swung open in Philippi for Paul to get out of jail before. And he's in jail here in Rome writing to the Philippians. He's not getting out while he's writing it. What does he mean, I can do all things? 
in this context. The context tells us the all things he refers to. Uh, from one end to the other of the spectrum, abundance and poverty, having lots of stuff and having nothing. I have learned to be content. I can do all things. And where does Paul get his strength? From Christ. From Christ, from being vitally connected, abiding in Christ. Apart from him, he could do nothing. But in Christ, with Christ, by the strength of Christ, joined to Christ, Paul could be content. Listen, afflictions test our theology. Our response to afflictions, if it's discontentment, reveal that our joy in God's sovereignty is not what it should be. That we have not embraced with gratitude God's goodness and his good ordering of our circumstances. I want to thank you for the last two weeks of listening in to me giving biblical counsel to myself. You got to sit in on my own private session. Contentment is not easy. Discontentment comes natural. And we need help in this, don't we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words, for this theology that is oh so practical, for these words, your words, which cut, they wound, and they bind up, they heal, they soothe, they salve. Lord, thank you for knowing us inside and out, for seeing through us and providing the remedies that we need. We pray that we would indeed be those who worship you from the heart, who, who not only profess your goodness, but believe it and live accordingly. Oh, how we long for the day when all things will be set right and we won't have to fight for contentment. In the meantime, oh Lord, let us fight for your glory and our good in Jesus' name. Amen.